Good morning and welcome everyone. We are Julie Batts and Joe Singer. We're the congregational leaders of Chochmat HaLev here in Berkeley, California. It's so beautiful to see all of you from so many places near and far gathered together to learn. What a pleasure. We're really an international community of learners. It's such a blessing to welcome you and to welcome our teacher, Dr. Aviva Gottlieb Zornberg. A few logistics and thank yous before we introduce Dr. Zornberg. Um, thank you to our executive director, Dorit Gashuri, and to Steve Friedkin. Um, Dorit, who holds all of the administrative and logistic uh, details to make programs like this possible, and Steve for being our Zoom gabai. Uh, this is now an official new uh, term that we have uh, coined to hold that role. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to all of our co-sponsors, a beautiful community that is woven together here in the Greater Bay Area, uh, to Beit Tikkun, the Coastside Jewish Community, Congregation Beth El, Congregation Beth Israel, Congregation B'nai Tikva, Congregation Netivot Shalom, the JCC of the East Bay, Kahila Community Synagogue, and Mendocino Coast Jewish Community. We're grateful to be in community with all of you. And also, and finally to uh, Chochmat HaLev members, Sue Reinhold and Deborah Newbrin for facilitating Aviva's annual visits to the Bay Area and to continued uh, connection to her through this online lecture and to Sue for moderating today's lecture. Just a note about our Zoom plans. We're really wanting to have the experience of being as much in the room with no distractions with Aviva as we can. So we're going to disable the chat during um, the teaching and then we'll turn it on again uh, at the end of the program for some Q&A and Sue will say more about that. Um, there's a link to the source sheet uh, that uh, Aviva will be referencing and Steve will put that link um, in the chat now. Um, so please uh, click on that link so that you have access to that as well. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Sue to share the flow of today's program and to introduce Dr. Zornberg to our community. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really my pleasure today to introduce our teacher, Dr. Aviva Zornberg. My name is Sue Reinhold. Dr. Zornberg was born in London and grew up in Glasgow, Scotland, where her father served as the head of Glasgow's rabbinical court. She studied with him from childhood, and he was her most important teacher of Torah. Dr. Zornberg earned a BA and a PhD in English literature from Cambridge University. And after make, making Aliyah, moving to Israel, and teaching English literature at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Dr. Zornberg then turned to teaching Torah, and lucky us that she did so. For over 25 years, she has taught Torah in Jerusalem and beyond, way beyond. Her many excellent books are considered contemporary classics on Torah and Tanakh, and her work has influenced our people's teachers all over the world, and that is something to be a teacher of teachers. She travels widely today virtually, lecturing in Jewish, academic, and psycho psychoanalytic settings. Dr. Zornberg's book on Leviticus will be her next publication. We've been very fortunate to have your wisdom with us in community every spring, Aviva, and we are blessed that we have been able to continue this tradition with you during the odd galut, or exile, of the pandemic. Now, we may be in a tentative movement towards the resolution of our global pandemic, at least in Israel and in California. And I dare say that there is a spring in our steps some days now as we contemplate a world made new by our ability to resume some of our old before times activities. And we are also moved as a people here in California, certainly 
by the dire situation in Israel of the past few weeks and our continued yearning for peace and justice in Israel and for all Israel's people. To these points, Dr. Zornberg's teaching often shines light on the most moving contradictions of our lives. Like any brilliant teacher, she insists that we hold uncomfortable and, and opposing truths together because from those truths, new things are made. That she does this by investigating the deepest wells of our beautiful tradition is a gift for us all. May more and more be revealed as we listen and learn. Thank you for coming to share with us once again. I give you our teacher, Dr. Aviva Zornberg. Thank you so much, Sue, for that very generous and personal introduction. Uh, I must say that your community uh, is one of the communities I hold closest to my heart. It's not that I recognize each individual of you, but when I look around at the faces, I have a general impression that I know you. Um, I know maybe there's some uh, illusion in this, but that, that's the way I feel. And I feel very at home with the faces I see on the screen. And thank you for appearing on camera, those of you who have. We have a painful, but I think ultimately hopeful subject for our meeting tonight. One way of putting it is we're going to be talking about Moses' anguished prayer to God to let him enter the land of Israel in spite of God's past decree that he would not be entering the land of Israel. So there is at the heart of what we're going to be talking about tonight, you know, what sounds like a fruitless prayer. Now, there's a sad subject. And in fact, I know many people, a number of people, women particularly, who cry every year when we read this parsha, the story of Moses' prayer. It's Parshat Vaitchanan. Deuteronomy chapter 3. That is the subject. But the real theme of our meeting has to do with the strange phenomenon, which I'm sure everyone has noticed, that we are, when we are concerned, for instance, that people will forget what has happened in the past, right? There is that concern. And Moses is concerned that after he dies, people shouldn't forget what the experience of, at Mount Sinai, the revelation, the exodus from Egypt, the whole epic history. And he says several times in the book of Deuteronomy in that last long speech to his people, right? He starts it about five months before he dies. And then on and off, he speaks throughout the book of Deuteronomy. About a third of the text is his speech. And he tells the whole story of his life with the people the past life with the people in the first person. This was my experience. This is how I now create our past together and how I now create, in a sense, myself for you. You perhaps have never really known me. And now by telling the story in such a full and intimate way, I, Moses, is for the first time really trying to create the, the being of Moses for them in such a way that they will not forget him either. And I don't think his motive is narcissistic. His motive has everything to do with the problem of the future. The problem of the future, of the fading of memory, of the fading of impressions, how everything disappears. And so there could be a time in the future, perhaps even our children, as he says, even the next generation will already be in a position of not having known our shared past, right? That's the same in every generation. We know that when we speak to our children and of course to our grandchildren, there is much of our lives that they simply cannot share. And if we think that it's important that something of that should re remain, then we have a task in front of us. But what I want to talk about is something even more troubling in a way. And that is that sometimes even people who have known things, who have heard things, who have seen things with their very eyes, can find themselves sometimes in a position of not 
knowing what has happened, of not actually having found a way to register their own experience. So that Moses finds himself speaking to a people from the beginning of the story, from the first moment when he says, I can't speak because I'm not a man of words, I'm not good at talking. He's complaining, we say, about stammering, right? That's the usual view, that he has a stammer. He's not a good communicator. What he's really saying is, I'm talking to people who are not capable of hearing me. And I don't feel I have the, the ability to make them listen to me and to make them know what they are experiencing at this very moment, as they're experiencing it. Now, what, what I'm talking about here may sound a little esoteric, but it's really not at all. It's the very familiar phenomenon of looking at the world and not noticing some of the most important things that are going on in your world because your mind is elsewhere. Somewhere you're distracted, somewhere you may even have what I'll call now and try to explain later. You may even have, as people do tend to have, a kind of passion for ignorance. Right? That's a very strong paradox. Uh, that is, there's something in us that loves not knowing. Because to know is in some way to make yourself responsible, to put a burden on yourself, to make yourself realize that you are in some way involved in the things you know, and you may not want that. Somewhere there's a, a tendency to, to shift, shuffle off things. Now, when I'm talking about Moses, Moses from the beginning of the story has said, people don't listen to me, Pharaoh doesn't listen to me, no one listens to me, because clearly Pharaoh has no reason to want to hear my message. And even the people who are suffering in slavery and should have an interest in hearing about the hopeful future, about what is about to happen, even they are not listening to me. And that's his repeated, that's a theme that goes through his early life with the people. Something changes in this last book, in the book of Deuteronomy, when he has that painful conversation with God about going into the land, something very radical changes. Uh, the scene, uh, it's uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 3. It's, I didn't put it a whole on your source page, but I'll just dip into it and uh, paraphrase it briefly. It's chapter 3, verse uh, 23 onwards, Parashat Ve'etzchanan. Moses prays to God, Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand and all the miracles you've done. Ebrana, please let me cross over. Here begins the real prayer. Let me cross over. Now, when he says cross over, cross over what? Cross the road? We know it means cross over the river. He is camped on one side of the river and he wants that God should allow him actually to ford the river and go over to the other side. And that's the expression he uses. Instead of using the expression, I want to go up to the land, which was the expression that was used in the book of Numbers, for instance, over and over again. La'alot, aliyah. That was the word for going into the land. Suddenly it becomes crossing over. And there's a very material reason for that, because he's just on the banks of a river, the River Jordan, and in order to get into the land, he will have to cross over. But here, there's a tremendous emphasis on the word, let me cross over and let me see the good land, which is be'ever hayardin, the same word as for crossing over, which is on the other side. So to cross over is to cross over from this side to that side depending on what you're talking about, a road, a river, pass through a country, right? That also occurs a great deal in the book of Deuteronomy when Moses asks the nations he passes through on the way to the land of Israel, he asks them for safe passage. Let me cross through. So that word keeps on recurring and the nations are not so happy to let him cross through and sometimes wars ensue. But then he comes to his prayer to God. And the prayer to God is not about enemy territory. It's about let me come home. Let me cross over the last, last barrier. And let me see um, that good land. Vayit aber Hashem bi 
and God was furious with me because of you. Who is you? Moses is telling this story to the people. It's part of his long speech to the people. And suddenly he's becoming very personal and he's talking about a prayer, a private moment with God that no one else knows about and no one else need know about. And he chooses now to tell the whole people about it. Why would he do that, especially in view of the full anguish of the experience that he is narrating? God was furious with me because of you or for your sake. Very strange word. It'll ring bells later, I hope. The word for furious, strangely, also has that root avar in it. The root that means to cross over. Clearly, it has a very different meaning. Here it's the word for anger, evra. But it seems that this kind of transport of anger, you know, that we can say in very literary English, he was transported with anger, meaning in some way he went beyond the usual limits and he crossed over into a region of anger. It's a very intense anger. Velo shama elai. I think those are among the most important words in the story. And he didn't listen to me. And here is Moshe who has so often complained to God about how the people are not listening to him. And now he's complaining to the people about how God didn't listen to him. And this is Moses, who has always had God's ear, as it were, that whenever he spoke, God would listen. And in the full meaning of listen, very often, that God would actually, as it were, change his mind about the evil he may have decided to do to the people, and Moses would dissuade him. In other words, Moses really had a very good access to God's attention. God always paid attention to him. And now suddenly in this last moment, right, right towards the end of his the last conversation, God did not listen to me. That's Moses' comment. And God said to me, Rav lecha, stop right there. Rav, al tosef, al tosef daber elai od badavar hazeh. Don't go on talking to me anymore about this thing. Very harsh. In Hebrew, it's even harsher than in English. I think I'll sharpen the English translation by the, never talk to me again on this matter. Right? It's a bit of you get the feeling there. I don't want to hear any more about this. About this this issue of going into the land. In other words, what is God doing here? It's not that he's not listening. He's listening and he's saying no. Right? It's, too, it's a little bit different. He is listening to what Moses says, and he is saying absolutely not. I don't want to hear any more about it. And in fact, I don't want to listen to you anymore on this subject. So God is stopping Moses from talking which is a paradoxical situation, of course, because the early history of Moses and God was that God was trying to persuade Moses to talk, to talk to the people. Moses was complaining, I'm not a man of words. Yes, you remember, I'm heavy of mouth, I'm heavy of tongue. He has some kind of a stammer, perhaps. That's how people sometimes translate it when you have a, an impediment, you know, a, a, a voice impediment, literally as if you have baggage impedimenta, you know, the Latin word impediment, the burden. I have a heaviness in my tongue and my heaviness in my lips. That's what, what, what Moses says. There is something that blocks me from speaking. And hence you have the idea of an actual stammer, something like that. And God spent some time at the beginning persuading Moses that nevertheless he should speak. Now, what Moses was complaining about then was that he couldn't speak to the people. And then he proves how right he is, that he's not a good speaker, he's not an effective speaker, because the people really don't listen to him. The people really refuse to take in what he's saying. It's not just that they don't obey him, but that they actually don't really get him on some, on some real level. They're not hearing him. And now the tables are turned, and God says to him, I want you to stop talking. Since when did God ever say that? To me. And notice that to me. About this matter. So it's not, don't, not really don't stop talking. 
has never stopped talking to me about this matter. And this is the God who was always willing and happy to listen to Moses in the past. And suddenly the slamming of the door, of the divine door, it's, almost, it's really a scene from Kafka. And I'm sure that Kafka took his scenes, you know, in the trial, the, scene, the, the courtroom scenes, the scenes of absolute frustration in law, having been, being, being barred from the law. I'm sure he was inspired to some extent by, the, by this passage, by this moment in which the door is slammed. I don't want to hear anything more, you speaking any, another word about this. So go up to the top of the mountain, God continues to say to Moses, and lift up your eyes, north, south, east, and west. You can see with your eyes, ki lo ta'avor et ayarden because But you will not cross over this river Jordan. So the answer to Moses' prayer, which was, let me cross over, is literal. You shall not cross over. The fact that Moses asked to see as well, it's as if God is giving him, the Midrash says with a kind of black humor, God was granting him half of his desire. He wanted to cross over and see, and God said, no, you can't cross over, but you can see. From a top of a mountain on this side of the river, that is. That's not really what Moses was asking for. When he said, I want to cross over and see, he meant from there, not from here. Not crossing over is losing everything. To see is, is not, not a comfort at, at this moment. And so God very harshly repudiates Moses' plea. And Moses sums up the situation by saying, with great pain, velo shama elai, and he wouldn't listen to me. And I'm hearing in that, on the one hand, the difference between what Moses says about this moment and what actually happened. God did listen. God did listen. He just said, no, there is a difference between the two. It's a prayer that's been refused. It's not that God didn't listen. And yet there is some truth to it, that when someone refuses to pay attention to what you want, refuses actually to grant you on some level what you want, then it's as if they're not listening to you. And there's a sense of being slighted. There's a sense of humiliation that really he just he wasn't interested in me. And he's always been so interested and here he cuts, cuts the links just like this. This is the story that Moses tells the people. And every time I, I, I touch on this, every time I, I read it, I try to teach it, I'm again, so, puzzled and mystified. Why would Moses tell such a humiliating story that doesn't seem to have any teaching in it for the people, to the people? Except if it's just to complain. <laughs> now, Moses is not really a complainer. That's not, that's not how we think of him as a, as, a, as a character, that he just feels the need to get it off his, off, to, how do we say, to, to blow off steam. It, it can't be that. He addresses the people usually in order to teach them something, right? You know, we call them teachings, Torah. The Torah is a teaching with a capital T. And here, what we have is a most personal narrative, which is almost embarrassingly unpublishable. You would have thought that Moses would not say a word about it. Who, who is it going to do any good to? Right? To whom is going, is, who is it going to benefit a story like this? It's not as if, right, the sages say in one midrash, trying to find a point to it, a teaching. They will say, this teaches you that even if a sharp knife, a sharp sword is poised upon your neck, you shouldn't give up on the possibility of mercy. In other words, you should still pray, even at the very last minute. That's all very well, but that's not the teaching of, the, of this story because God doesn't change his mind. God, it's not as if do this and then all will be well, you know, um, to the very, actually it doesn't happen. So here you have a story that doesn't end well from Moses' point of view. Why does he share it with the people? What, what, what that is positive could they get from this? The question is strengthened by 
a very close reading of what God said to Moses when he was being so very dismissive of him, so rejecting. He says, don't go on speaking to me, never speak to me again about this matter. And I'm emphasizing now the word me. It's a question of how you read. It's a question of how you interpret. You could not, you could not emphasize that word, in which case you'd just be totally mystified. Why is God banging the door? But I'm emphasizing the Lee because I, it's what um, a contemporary philosopher, Donald Davidson calls the principle of charity. I rather like the idea that when you are reading something or when you are telling a story or you're listening to a story, the principle of charity is that you assume there is meaning. You assume that it's not absurd what you're hearing, what you're reading. And I want to assume that it's not God just willfully shutting the door in his face, that there's a certain hint here that God is saying something when he says, I don't want to hear another word about this from you to me. Don't talk to me. And what I'm hearing in it is that Moses should do what in fact he does, and that is tell the people. That he should tell the people, although it's counterintuitive, why would he? What would be his, his aim? And that's my subject for our meeting this morning, your morning. Um, I want to be thinking about what Moses is really telling the people. What is it that he's putting in front of the people and hoping that he'll, they'll hear him? Hoping that for once he can be sure that they really will hear him. That's, that's the situation, as, as, as I want to put it at, at this point. And what we have now is a series of sources that I want to direct your attention to on your source page, or if you have it on the screen, um, in which the possibility is raised that, as we said to start with, to the very end, the people manifest, they demonstrate their inability to hear what is being said to them. Now, how does that work? Now, do you have to be really stupid? What do you have to be to be a person like this? I'm assuming right away, again, it's the principle of charity. I'm assuming that it's not a matter of stupidity. I'm assuming that it's a matter that we all know about. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the Torah. You know, if, the, if we weren't familiar with this syndrome, then what would be the point of, of, of teaching it to us? And so what you have here, if you look, for instance, I'm going to jump to number four, to the fourth source on your page. You have the comment of a modern, that is 19th century, Hasidic commentary on the, on, on, on the, Torah, on the Torah text. Um, and he is actually addressing an earlier moment in the book of Deuteronomy. It's right at the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 1, verse 9, where Moses starts speaking all these words. By Yedaber Moshe, and Moses speaks to the children of Israel all these words. And that is the headline for the whole book, as if pointing out how very much Moses is, is talking in this book. And in fact, the Midrash says, if you want to read it, it's actually the last passage on your page. And it's just um, the very beginning of the passage, number eight, uh, the first line. These are the words that Moses spoke. And so the sages notice, the Midrash notices, that this is the man who said just yesterday, I'm not a man of words. I can't speak. I can't communicate. I can't, people don't listen to me. I can't make them listen to me. And so Israel now says, just yesterday you said, I'm not a man of words. And now you've got so much to say. In other words, it's a kind of whimsical humor in this Midrash, as if Israel notices this sudden change that Moses has so very much to say to the people suddenly from being someone who had no confidence in his power actually to say anything to the people, that everything he tried to teach them or to tell them, they seemed somehow resistant. They were rebellious or they, or they uh, and suddenly here he is talking away so much, the whole book of, of Javari. But what is it that he says at the heart of this opening moment? He says, I can no longer carry you alone. 
it's verse 9, I can no longer lead you alone. Right? The image of carrying is one he often uses. The burden of you. I can no longer carry the burden of leading you alone. And therefore, I want you to appoint a whole system of small claims courts of all kinds, a hierarchy uh, of courts who will help me judging you when you need, you know, when you bring civil, civil cases that need deciding, a whole, a whole support system. So, and, and so have a bring, appoint people who are wise and nevonim, understanding, and yeduim and well-known, distinguished. In other words, find some prominent, highly intelligent, highly understanding. That's the word I'm interested in. Navon, Navonim. That's one of his qualifications, one of his demands, who will, who will form a kind of hierarchical structure and they will help me uh, carry you, as it were, bear the burden of you. And that's what the, the passage obviously means. However, here our Hasidic writer says, this is one of those cases where the plain meaning of the text is not the real meaning of the text. You have to listen well. What was he really saying to them when he said, I can't carry you alone? He said he wouldn't be able, I'll, I'll, I'll start a little earlier in the passage, Moses knew, he felt somehow, this is before perhaps God told him, that God's desire was that Joshua would lead the people into the land. And Moses desired that the people should pray for him to God, that they do not desire any other leader. Now I'm deliberately translating rotse, which means to want, to wish, as desire, just in order to make you notice the word. Moses wanted, God wants Joshua to take over from Moses. Moses knows that already. He says he, he felt it, some kind of intuitive knowledge. But God hasn't said it yet, or has he? But Moses wanted that the people should want. Look what a play of, of wanting going on here. God's wanting, Moses wanting, about the people's wanting. I want them to want me and want no one but me. If they want me in that way, in that unequivocal way, they will pray for me. So he's really asking the people to help him. I can't do it alone. My prayers are not enough for my own future, but your prayers may help. So he's asking them to pray for him. And the way that our Hasidic writer puts it is very untechnically. It's not what is pray, whatever. It's not religious language, it's desire language. I want you to want me. Now that's that embarrassing dynamic, you know, between a lover and a beloved, I want you to want me. Who, who doesn't feel that? If you want someone, you want them to want you. But you can't say it. Do you agree with me? Even in our very uh, forward days, right? And even if I'm dating myself by saying this, you know, I would blush to say that to someone. Or even, you know, even to, to, to make it too clear, you know, I would, I would keep that part very well hidden, that I want you to want me. I'm more willing to say I want you, but I'm not so willing to say I want you to want me. And of course, that is the posture of every leader, every political leader, you want to, put, to put it no more strongly. What they're all angling for is desire. I want you to want me. And they're trying to fan the flame. They're not ashamed. <laughs> they don't actually say it in so many words, or sometimes they say it in so many words. You know, there's no bashfulness about it. But Moses knows he can't say it. So what is he doing? He's hinting. That's the word that's used in this measure. Other, he's hinting to them. Can't say it outright. So he says, I can't lead you alone. And he hopes they will understand that what he means is not just that I need help in, in setting up the law courts, but I need you if I'm to continue as your leader. I need your prayers. And perhaps there's something in his tone that leads him to feel that perhaps they will hear and they don't understand. Lo hevinu, the Midrash says, they didn't get it. Lo hevinu. Hevinu is that word which is connected with the understanding people 
that Moses is looking for. He says, bring people who are wise and understanding. And when the people, the, the, uh, the associate judges are actually appointed, we read that we're just wise and famous, wise and well-known. And the understanding has dropped out. No, there are no understanding people. And here the Midrash says, and our Hasidic master comments on it, notices it. The Midrash says, I didn't find any understanding people. Understanding means the classic understanding of understanding, the word bina, tvuna. It's the virtue that's classically, rabbinically associated with women. Ladies, you can, you can feel good about this. Uh, bina, tvuna is to understand one thing from out of another thing. Somewhere to intuit what is inside, what is hiding inside something that doesn't seem to mean exactly that. It's what we call intuition, or what I would like to call really imagination. And I'll be saying more about imagination. That is, it's a capacity to go beyond the letter of things, you know, the minimum of what Moses might have meant, and to hear what the, his appeal to them that he's actually praying to them. And I, I, you understand what I mean. He's pleading with them to plead for him. And that is a complex situation. And here I depend on your, on your imagination and your life experience to know what that situation is like. And we'll see as we go on now that our Hasidic master, the Meir Shiloach, the Ishbitzer, as he's known, uh, is not taking this idea from nowhere. He, he's not uh, cutting it out of the expression to cut it out of whole cloth. He's not, he's, not, he's not inventing it. But in fact, there is a Midrashic background, that is an ancient rabbinic background for this idea that Moses is actually implicitly, you know what I mean by implicitly? Right? He is appealing to the people to do something for him, which has to do with wanting him and appealing for him. And it doesn't happen. And the people lo hevinu. That's the theme. It's a sad theme. It's almost, a, again, a kind of Kafkaesque theme. You know, that someone has, has, his, has his whole heart bound up in a certain desire, which he can only hint at. But he thinks the hint should be enough. Why does he think the hint should be enough? because I did everything for them. Now, here we're again on very dangerous territory. I sacrificed for you. Why aren't you willing to want me, really? Again, it's embarrassing. I'm almost blushing myself as I say it, and I'm not, I'm not talking about myself. Yeah, it's, One doesn't say such things. The most you can do is, is hint. So there, there is a, a hint. And let's have a look now at one of the two Midrashic sources I want, to, I want to share with you on this subject, on saying and not saying, on saying in a hinting way, which hopes to open up, open a door in the other person's awareness. Okay. Now, we do this very often. Okay. A very crude example that comes to my mind. Uh, it's hot in here. What are you really saying? please open the window, right? It's a silly example, but, but you see what I mean. Yeah? You, you don't want to ask the other person to do something. So you just say as if oops, a, a meteorological uh, comment. Um, oh, it's just hot in here. And you're hoping the other person will be sufficiently engaged with you to feel your feelings because you are engaged with them. You know? So you feel it's, you don't even feel it's tit for tat. It's not tit for tat. It's just, it's the nature of the relationship. That's, that's what you assume. Have a look at the Midrash in number five. When they came to cross the Jordan, Moses reminded them all the times that he had asked, he had acted as their defense counsel, that he had intervened when they were in trouble with God uh, in order to save them from death. For instance, the story of the golden calf, that's the, that's the classic example. The story of the golden calf. So he, he, he reminds them about, about this at the last moment before he crosses the Jordan. Because he assumed 
that they would also pray for him, ask for mercy for him, that he should enter the land together with them. How does he hint this to them? It's very clever. It's very beautifully done in, in terms of the text. He says to them over and over again in the book of Deuteronomy, you can thread through the references, Ata over, atem overim, you are crossing over. Ani eneni over, I am not crossing over. Now, listen to that. Right. If you say that explicitly, I, you, are, you are crossing over, I'm not crossing over, then that is pretty explicit, I would almost say. It's really like saying it's hot in here. Meaning, I, somewhere, I feel the difference between you and me. Do you feel it? Do you, do you want me to have you cross over with you? So somewhere, it's really it's pretty explicit. Sometimes, quite often, he just says, you are crossing over, without adding, I'm not crossing over. And then one wonders, why does he have to keep on, you know, hammering this, this nail? You are crossing over. You are cross they know what, where they are and what they're about to do. But he's trying to make them aware of an aspect of the situation that they may not be so aware of. And he hopes they will twig. <laughs> you know, they will, they will hear it. No, they don't. And that is, you know, there's, in, in every instance, that's how the story ends, as it were, that they don't, that they don't get it. Um, and then we have uh, a, a mashal. I am not pos, pa, crossing over. He said the way the, the way the text puts it here. The midrash puts it. Patach lahem petach. Shema yivakshu alavracham. He's opening a door. When he says you are crossing over and I'm not crossing over, that's like opening a door to make them aware of something they may not have been able to think about before. But it doesn't work. And you know, each time he says it, he's hopeful, but it doesn't work. And here is a parable. It's a very difficult parable about a queen who displeased her husband. That's what we're told. And he decided to marry another woman, to, to divorce her and to marry another woman. And uh, he calls her and he says to her, have you heard that I'm going to be marrying another woman? And she says, yes. Um, may I know the name of the lady? And he tells her, yeah, gives her the name. What does the lady do then? She calls all her many children together. They're called her children. Not their children, but her children. She calls her children together that she had had together with the king. And she tells them, you know your father is, is going to marry another woman? Can you put up with having a stepmother? And that's what you might call a hint. What does, what does the mother of these children really want from her children? That they should, uh, you know, demonstrate, <laughs> put on a fierce demonstration outside the king's rooms or something like that. In other words, that they should protest, that they should appeal to their father for their mother. Now, the fact is, of course, that the mother is in some kind of double situation here. She is the wife of, of the king, and she is the mother of the children. As the wife, she has displeased her, pleased her husband. But as the mother of the children, maybe there's still hope. Maybe the children, who are the king's children as well. And the children just don't get it. They, they're deaf. You might say they're emotionally deaf. That they simply say, oh, can you put up with having a stepmother? Well, you know, stepmothers have very bad uh, um, PR. You know, it's not, uh, not, they haven't got a good reputation. But they are quite blithe about it. And they say, yes, that's fine. And then she says to them, she tries to say, you know, it won't be so easy when you have a, a stepmother instead of a mother. You know, you won't have this peculiar situation where, you know, she can, she can appeal to the king because she's your mother. In other words, the whole, the power of the Oedipal situation will be gone. Now what we have is a peculiar situation in which your mother really cares for you. And if you really care for her, you might have, be able to save the situation. And they simply don't hear it. And then she says to them, now I'm really worried for you. It's, I think it's a very powerful midrash. She says, if you are really so deaf to the implications of things, 
your imagination is so um, stultified, then I worry for your fate. Et Hashem Elokecha Tira. It's a quotation from the book of Deuteronomy. You better fear your father. In other words, you won't have your mother to act as a loving interceder for you. It's going to work by fear from now on. Your father will get angry with you and you'd better watch it. You'd better, you know, you'd better make sure not to make him angry. It'll be a different game altogether from now on. And clearly the mother is disappointed. She's disappointed in the non-reaction of her children. Just as Moses is disappointed when the people don't respond in a similar in a similar mode, and here here we have the same theme of of not understanding, right? and ultimately um, the fact that uh, the mother or Moses is worried for the people and has really let put aside her, his her own concerns at that by I think by the end of this, you really are in some way emotionally cramped. There's something, there's something missing here, that you are capable of not knowing what really I could have expected you to know. Now, here is a question now of how we interpret. What do we think of someone who just doesn't, who refuses to know what we think they should know? Take an extreme example, because I've been just, just been reading some about this. Um, what do we think of people who lived in Germany during the Shoah and claim afterwards not to have known anything, even if we believe them? We are rather, rather unhappy, put it, to put it no more strongly. How could you not know? There must have been a desire not to know. And we do get to a position like that sometimes when we think people are being really obtuse. It's not intelligence we're talking about. We're talking about something to do with relationship, to do with being able to put yourself in the other person's shoes, to, to think yourself into the situation and not just to read about those Jews and hear about those Jews without being involved at all. So that we have pretty dire judgment in that case. On the other hand, you know, I would like to speak from the point of view of compassion as well. I remember a story about myself. Um, when I was a child, I suppose about nine, 10 years old, my mother was going to have an operation and she was really afraid. Um, and she told me, you know, I'm, I'm going in tomorrow for an operation, explained. And, and then she said, um, she thought I was very heart stricken about it, as she was. Um, and so she said, you know, I'm going to spend some time with some friends this evening. Uh, would you like to come with me? She thought that I would want to be with her the last evening before she goes to have the operation. And I said, I blush to say, I said, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> meaning, you know, I may have said it in a different way, but meaning I don't, I'm not interested in spending an evening with, with older people. Um, I didn't get it. I, I didn't get her feel of fear of death. I didn't get what she was, what, I didn't get what, she, what she, she, she was feeling. And, you know, there we have it. You could say, I couldn't have got it. A child doesn't get such things. It's a matter of maturity. It's a matter of, you know, I could make all kinds of, I think, valid excuses. There are all kinds of situations in which, so you, you can't afford to know. It's, it just would be too expensive uh, to, to, to be able to take that in. But nevertheless, that is a phenomenon. That is something that happens in the world that I speak and you can't hear. Even if I'm really hinting rather, rather, rather strongly. And it's this situation that I want to follow up now by looking at the next Midrashic passage. What do we have here? In this case, yes. We read this, we go to the end of the book of Deuteronomy, almost Moses' last words to the people. And again, a very strong sentence, a very strong evaluation of the people. Doesn't, doesn't mince his words. 
ולא נתן לכם השם לב לדעת, ו... לב לדעת ועיניים לראות ואוזניים לשמוע עד היום הזה. God has not given you a heart to know and ears to hear and eyes to see until this very day. That is, Moses is saying to the people right at the end of his story, you have always been rather insentient. Insentient means you're, it's as if you don't have senses. You don't hear what is being said to you. You don't see what's in front of you. And of course, the heart of the matter is the heart. Live la dat. The heart mind, I would say, consciousness. A, con a, a heart mind to be, co to be conscious with. Somehow God doesn't seem to have equipped you with any of these, which is a way of saying you are amazingly obtuse. All along, you have been rebelling. You have been not wanting whatever it was that I wanted or God wanted. You have been in essentially not listening. That's been your story. Ad hayom hazeh. Till this very day. And here we have a kind of ambiguity. Ad bichlal or lo ad bichlal? The way the rabbis put it. Does that include this day or does it not include this day? Is Moses saying to them to the very end, you are remaining completely cut off from your reality? Or is he saying, till today and today there's a change? Today, I sense from today onwards, I'm hopeful that something is changing. So, of course, we prefer the optimistic uh, reading here. But what, what is Moses talking about? This Medrash asks now when he says, you have been amazingly insentient. The usual understanding is that he's talking about the general history of the people with God and the people in, in relation to religious and moral and ethical crises that keep coming up and the way that they don't seem to respond well to them. But the Midrash here strikes out and very unexpectedly says, no, Moses is talking about himself. He's narrowing down the scope of the meaning of that verse to the people's relation to him. And he's saying, to the end, or almost to the end, you're not capable of hearing me. In my own case, when I appeal to you, for instance, to pray for me, you have managed somehow not to get it. Not, 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 not to intervene, not to manage, not to want to ask for mercy from God. And what follows here then, after this tochacha, it's called, it's a rebuke of the people. Is, is, is involved in this expression. You are heartless and blind and deaf. And it's a tochacha, it's a rebuke from Moses personally, not just about their general uh, religious standing, right? but in a way, it's a shockingly personal um, evaluation of the people that they somehow, and it's from a very personal point, from a point of hurt and disappointment and in the, in the relationship between the people and himself. There's something embarrassingly personal about this. And then what follows is a passage that I'll just touch on very briefly, in which we hear this, that God made two harsh decrees. One was against the people and one was against Moses. First one was the decree to destroy the people after the golden calf. Yes. In that case, Moses prayed to God and said, Slachna, please forgive them. And God forgave. God said, Salachti Kidvarecha. These are the words we say, of course, you know, on Kol Nidre, beginning of Yom Kippur. Salachti Kidvarecha. I have forgiven as you have spoken, meaning your words have saved them. For your words are equivalent to me to my actions, you know, your words move me to act. And then there was a decree against Moses that you will not cross over, Lota Avor. And Moses pleads, he says, please, please let me cross over. And God says to him, you can't have it both ways. Now, this is between Moses and God. And I've never really understood why can't you have it both ways? Why can't you intervene for the people and then also intervene for yourself? 
But the way that Moshe, the God, puts it in this midrash is, you can, if you want me to annul that decree, decree, then you have to let me force this decree, enforce this decree. You can have one of the two, not both. Now, I don't know why those are the rules of the game, <laughs> but those are the rules of the game, apparently. I, I have some thoughts, and if you have thoughts, I'd be happy to hear them afterwards. Um, why can't you have it both? You can't hold the rope at both heads. That's the image that's used here. You can't control reality. You can't transform reality wholesale. In transforming reality, all right, I'm really thinking of something to say here. In transforming reality, you can only half transform reality. You can use words to change things, but only so far. There will always be a certain frustration, a certain pain in that desire that we have to have it our way, to have the world be our way. You can transform things, but then you can also realize that there is a real gap between what you want and the way things, the way things are. So you can have one of the two. And of course, when Moses is faced with that choice, he says wonderfully, you know, it's a completely altruistic rebuke to the people. He says, you know what I said to God then? I said, let Moses and a hundred like Moses die. Let a hundred Moseses die so long as not one nail on one of your hands gets injured. Of course, there's no choice. Uh, of course, I'll choose you every time over me. And then there is the satirical last note in the Midrash. Moses is really rebuking the people and saying to them, Moses could save, one man could save 600,000 people, but 600,000 people couldn't save one Moses. Didn't feel moved right, to try to, it's the thing people say about parents and children. I don't know if you've heard that particularly bitter statement. You know, the one mother could look after six children, but six children couldn't look after uh, one mother. And again, it, the, always when I read these things, I hear the, I have a double reaction. I have a complicated reaction. On the one hand, it's true. <laughs> it's true. On the other hand, it's asking for too much. You know, it's asking for the total desire of the mother or of the, of the leader. You don't get your total desire. It can't be like that. There's something wrong with that kind of logic. And that's where I want to move on now to this question of what is Moses doing in telling the story to the people? What, what does he hope to achieve? And the way I want to approach it is through this word tochacha. Tochacha is rebuke. Moses is implicitly rebuking the people, and this they hear, when he says to them, of course I chose you rather than me. Of course one person saved 600,000 and 600,000 couldn't save one. That they have to get. <laughs> they, they will hear that. But it's too late at this point. I want to suggest that if Moshe, if Moses is rebuking the people, that's a very unattractive word in English to rebuke. The word in Hebrew is more, it's more playful in a way. It's more dynamic. What is lochiach? It has at its heart the word nocheach. Nocheach means presence, to be present. It's a wonderful word for simply to be present. Liot nocheach. When you rebuke someone, you confront the other person. In a way, you don't hold back. You're not embarrassed to say things that make, make you sound unattractive when you are you're saying it like it is, and you are giving your full presence to the moment. And that means even things that you wouldn't normally say about yourself, you are saying. And you're setting up a drama of confrontation between the true self, my true self, and your true self. How, what, how does that work then? In the, case of, in the case of Moses here, when he says, I want to cross over. What is, really, what is he really saying to cross over? I want to cross over that Jordan. And God answers him and says, you shall not cross over. Joshua will cross over. 
but you will not cross over. Over and over again, yes, you have that emphasis. What is it love for? All right, to come into the land, I understand. But why is that particular image used of to cross over, to cross, go past a limit, to yearn to go past a limitation, a boundary of, of some kind? Uh, if I think of the word to pass in English or the word for past the, the, in, 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 this, in sense of time and space, yes, the past is what's behind you. The past, that which you have passed, is that which is, right, with the past, the Oxford English Dictionary, it says that which is, um, uh, sorry, lapsed, gone, lapsed, done with, over. It's even a, a between language pun there. Over is over. Avar is over, over. <laughs> meaning that that is, I put that behind me. That's what I, I want to be in a position of putting the past behind me and reaching out to something else, being already involved in the future. And God has said to me, that's no longer for you. What does that mean? It means in some sense, let's think of a, a, a spatial example. The example of in the Song of Songs, very beautiful, powerful uh, text there. My beloved, right? I, I opened the door to my beloved. Dodi chamak avar. My beloved slipped past. Chamak is, is, it means to slip. And avar passed by, meaning I saw my lover for a second. There was a transient moment. I saw him and then he disappeared. That's all I got of him. I got a fleeting moment of him. Right? It's repeated in the Song of Songs. I was always seeking him and not finding him. Now to seek is not to find. Right? That, that would be the sad way of putting it. That when one, when one desires, I'm, thinking, I'm talking about desire now, desire never finds what it wants. It may get a glimpse. It may get a glimpse and then have to use a lot of imagination to fill out, to fill out that glimpse. There is something about that movement, that movement of eros, yeah, the erotic movement, which is something that Moses very much wants to have in his life still. His whole life has been based on it, on the movement onwards on trying to create almost impossible realities by transcending trans, right? It's all the words that begin with trans in a way, right? To transform, to go, to go beyond a given reality. That's the movement of Eros. There's a very wonderful book by Anne Carson, the Canadian uh, philosopher, Greek scholar, poet, uh, dramatist, essayist, uh, you name it. Uh, one, of the, one of the most interesting people creative people, I think now, um, there's a book that she's, she wrote called Eros, the Bittersweet. I understand the sweetness of Eros, the sweetness of desire. What is the bittersweet? It's a quotation actually from a poem by the Greek poet Sappho, woman poet, talking about an impossible situation of desire, a situation with a, a triangular a triangular situation in which the sharpness of desire is felt precisely in the knowing that you can't have what you want. That's when the desire is really there at its, at its most acute. And that's the bitter sweetness of it. That there is a sweetness that you can't deny because there's something, a certain delight involved in that reaching out beyond yourself, crossing over. And on the other hand, there is always pain. It, eros means pain. And it depends, I suppose, on one's own um, mood or philosophy or, or even theology, perhaps, which one of the two one stresses. 
What Anne Carson is interested in talking about is simply the mixture of the two, the bitter sweetness. And the bitter comes first because that's in a way the unexpected one. You think of Eros as it's an expansive movement. I go beyond my, my boundaries. And what we have here then is that reaching out, right? It's the ever in Hebrew, another word, use of the word ever is as, as a wing. What does a wing, wing do also? It's the sense of unclipped wings that I'll go. On the other hand, in Greek poetry, you have, have these, these, this is from, all from Anne Carson, the Greek material is from Anne Carson. Um, the idea of desire being like wanting ice on a very hot day and knowing that as soon as you've got it, it will start melting in your hot little hand. Yes, there is the cruel, the cruelty of Eros in this particular form. I have to say that personally, I'm a little more optimistic than, uh, than pessimistic. The, the scales for me uh, go a little bit towards, in other words, I don't think it's exactly like ice, <laughs> that you're just left with lukewarm water at the end. No, I, I, I really would like not to believe that. But still, you have to understand the logic. That's the structure in a way of desire and its grasping. The more it's there, the less, less one has it. Presence and absence. Aristotle said, human beings by their very nature, reach out to know. Reach out to know. That is crossover. Reach beyond their own proper edges. Stand at the edge of themselves in order to do two things that we love to do that desire is involved. One is love, loving, and the other is knowing. There is a desire, there is an eros about knowing, libido sciendi, the Romans called it, the, the libido <laughs> of knowing, the desire to know more than one, than one knows. It always involves, in a sense, putting oneself off balance. It's not just making oneself comfortable by importing a little knowledge. It's reaching out to know, putting yourself in a way off balance at the very edge of your being to know and see and hear what's not quite comfortable to know and see and hear. And, and that, that, that I'm, I'm trying to suggest, I'm suggesting that that is the meaning of please let me cross over. When Moses says cross over as if that is the thing he wants, it's not just to go into the land and to see the land. It's, it's that going beyond my reach and thereby, yet again, you know, and all right, there'll be the rebound or whatever, but I can't believe that my real life is over, which was a life of Ebrana. That, that was his life in a sense all the way through, going to the top of the mountain and being with God in the fire where no one can be. There was something in him, there was clearly no reluctance in his life to go there. That was his natural place natural, unnatural place. Uh, it seems that he's more comfortable talking to God at the top of the mountain than at the bottom of the mountain trying to communicate with the people. That it's a more, that's a more natural situation for him. So what do we have now? I'm suggesting that Moses recognizes in God's hint to him, don't say another word to me about this matter, that now his reach has to shift, not a reach across the River Jordan, but a reach towards his people, to go and really try to talk to them, to try to overcome some of the barriers that have stood in a way quite naturally between him and them. They are different kind of people. I was reading something recently, I don't know if this is helpful or not, about highly sensitive people, which is a category now it's actually a diagnosis um, for, for psychologists. Um, people, some people have certain neurological, highly sensitive people. And the, the terrible realization of, that such people have that everyone else is not like them. That everyone else doesn't have these sensitivities. It's very hard to take in a way to realize that. So that, that's my, my little example there. For, for Moses, that is not a simple thing, to be with people. And now he recognizes that the horizon of his desire has to shift from the Holy Land, from a geographical, concrete movement across the river, 
to the metaphorical movement towards his people through words, through language, but words of a different kind. Not the words of God's laws, or not only the words of God's laws, spoken in the authoritative tone of Moses, our teacher. Right? That's his primary role, as we remember it throughout the generations. Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, who's there to teach us God's, God's laws. What I want to suggest is that Moses uncovers through speeches like this, where he tells the people the unspeakable, the embarrassing, the, the movements of his own unconscious, the disappointment, and the humiliation and the sense of frustration with the people, the sense of grievance that there is clearly there in these midrashic re-renderings. That he is really upset with them. <laughs> he's, he's, he feels, I gave you so much, and you, 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 no reciprocity at all. These are not things that you normally want to say to people. And in fact, he doesn't say them, but he hints them. He hints them up to a certain point. He's hinting, please pray for me. And when that fails, he tries to get through to them with a story of God's rejection, which is really a story of their rejection. It's not God who's rejecting him. It's that they didn't do the, play their role in this story with God. They didn't, they didn't enter the triangle and become, become effective. And in the end, it's him and the people, not him and God. That was, that was for the past. There was a time for that. There's something rather painful when I think of Moses and his destiny in contemplating this. And that is, um, yes, it happens twice when Moses is up at the top of the mountain, Mount Sinai, that God says to him, Lech Red, get on down there. I, I, I translate it a little roughly like that, abruptly, get on down there. Your place is not here with me. Your place is down there with the people. Ata lamali. This is the midrashic gloss on it. It really elaborates the, the shock of this moment for Moses. God says to Moses, now that the people have sinned, what do I need you for? Ata lamali. We are not just having a delicious dialogue up here to everyone's pleasure, to our mutual desire and pleasure. Your whole purpose is for the sake of the people. The use that I have of you is your relationship to the people. You take down the things that you hear up here, your, your pleasure and your desire. You try to transfer it, lavor, to tra transfer it to the people in some way to diminish your own satisfaction by translating into another language, going down and talking human language. And God says to Moses, that's your place, not this. Especially after the people have sinned, it becomes an emergency. Then it becomes really urgent that Moses go down there, not just pray to God for the people, but find a way of talking to the people that should in some way change the situation. And my suggestion is that in the book of Deuteronomy, in these last months of his life, facing the dilemma of his own blocked, closed doors, the closed doors that bar him from entry into one object of desire, he translates, transfers his desire into reaching the people to reach through to the people. And how, how, how does he do it? It becomes a kind of pedagogical moment. It's a teaching, it's a teaching moment. And I'd like to, to put it like this. Um, yes. What Moses is doing in telling the story, his own personal hurtful story of his relation with God, 
is staging himself for the people as someone who is ready to speak his whole truth, his whole experience to the people in some sense of trust that they will get it and they, what they will get will be helpful to them. What he's doing is actually showing the people, I'm calling it staging. He's playing the role of himself now. He's letting them see who he is by talking and talking and talking as the teacher, but not this time as the teacher who is there to teach authoritative divine law, but as the teacher who is there to reveal to the student something else, not just information, and perhaps this is always the case in any teaching situation. There's a wonderful essay by the French uh, philosopher Roland Barthes, uh, B-A-R-T-H-E-S. He talks about the relationship between the teacher and the student. It's a big theme for him, the relationship between the teacher and the student. In rabbinic writing, it's also an extremely important theme, the Rav and the Talmud paradoxical relationship, a relationship full of all kinds of complex nuances and great importance. And what Bart suggests is something that's quite striking. Bart says the teacher talking away, you know, the usual frontal arrangement where the teacher talks and, the, and there's a silent audience listening to him, something like the present situation um, between, between us, uh, I hate to say, um, but, but there is a, what is the teacher actually doing? What is he like? And Bart says, su surprisingly, it's like the psychoanalytic situation with the patient talk, talk, talking away to a silent audience who is the analyst. Right? It's a reversal of what you might have thought, that the teacher is really the patient. That Moses is telling it about himself. He is, he is actually laying out in front of the people, if not in so many words, but by staging it that way, the vulnerability of the one who is speaking, who can't be sure of what the reaction is on the other side. The teacher is in a very vulnerable situation, very exposed, and the students are sitting there aware of all kinds of meanings as they listen to the teacher, if this is a if this is an emotionally intelligent class, then they are aware of all kinds of things that the teacher didn't mean to convey. That is, the teacher is conveying all form, many forms of unmeant knowledge, not just the official curriculum of what's supposed to be conveyed. In fact, that's very difficult to get people to agree to take in. Right? There's a great resistance to learning material to having someone actually teach you things that you have to hold on to. And there's a very great difficulty about learning in general. Freud says learning, education, is one of the three impossible professions. Everyone knows, anyone who's tried it, knows how extremely frustrating it is. You know, there is the teacher reaching out towards the student. By reaching out, I now am using, using the idea of simply talking. I'm talking without being aware fully of what the reaction is. I'm just laying it, laying myself out there. And in this situation, I can have, be very, I can have very little confidence that the class is going to get what I want them to get and that what they are getting is going to be good for them. I guess I really, I really don't, I really don't know. I don't know anything. So the kind of act of trust involved in the patient lying on the couch and just talking and talking and talking, being involved as it were in his own life, but actually talking to another who could have all kinds of frightening responses or non-responses. It's a, it's, it's a scary situation. Now that is a situation of transference in psychoanalysis. That's what leads the patient, in this case Moshe, to become extremely attached to the analyst. Because I have so much to lose, because I don't know, I can imagine all kinds of things that the listener is thinking. You know. So imagination starts working, there is transference, and that's reaching across. Transference is using your imagination 
to reach across using your experience to reach across and to try in some way to create your listener that I do really do know what the listener is thinking but it's a very vulnerable situation what are the people getting out of this I'm suggesting the people are hearing Moses not as the immaculate information information uh, granting law giving teacher that what they are hearing is Moses the man that what they are hearing is the desire of a human being which meets very partial satisfaction and the disappointment the frustration seeing that staged in front of them and coming to understand something then about themselves somewhere that 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 way of listening that makes one aware of something about life that is more valuable to know and to allow to move one than all the information that is something about the meaning of what it is to be a human being uh, Kafka has a famous passage that I want to read to you in his diaries um, which gave me the name for my book uh, on Moses, A Human Life. And the passage goes like this. He is on the track of Canaan all his life. It is incredible that he should see the land only when on the verge of death. You know, there's something incredible, he says, about that. I hear that in German. It's really, it's very serious. It's impossible in a way. It's unbelievable that, that should happen. The dying vision of it can only be intended to illustrate what possibly could it teach. And here is the teaching a la Kafka. How incomplete a moment is human life. Incomplete because a life like this could last forever and still be nothing but a moment. It's incomplete moment. It's nothing but a moment. It's a matter of the moment of crossing over. Right? It's the moment of having a glimpse Moses fails to enter Canaan not because his life is too short but because it is a human life he could have lived not 120 years but 360 years and it would still end in the middle there would be no ultimate grasping that that Kafka is saying something, on the face of it, very lugubrious, very, very sad, very Kafkaesque. But hearing it now, in terms of Moses, in terms of the biblical Moses and the rabbinic Moses, it begins to feel a little less lugubrious. Because what Moses is doing at the end there is accepting the arrest of his desire. Right? The fact that his desire has had to be has been wrenched away from him, that the possibility of, 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 of being able to hold the rope at both hands, in both, at, both, at both ends, that that is just not possible. You can hold only one end. There is always the pain as well as the delight. And so he wants it with the people now. He wants to reach across to the people if he can't reach across to the land. And the question is, does he actually make it? Does he manage to achieve that desire at the least. That already is the compromise as far as Moses is concerned. That's the desire that was not really his desire to start with. So it's a kind of fruit of education. It's the result of his own psychoanalysis, as it were, that he is able now to put his self aside and talk about himself in a way, such a way as to affect the people. And what does he say to them there at the end? When we get, when we get right to the end, he says to them, God hasn't given you a heart to know and eyes to see and ears to hear until this day. But today I do realize, this is how Rashi reads, reads this. Today I realize that you really do have a desire for God. I've been dubious about that all along. Whether you really have any desire in yourselves for this whole journey I've been taking you on. This is not Moses the person. This is Moses, the leader, speaking. Today, I suddenly realize that you are more than I was willing to give you credit for being. That all along, in a sense, I have been not knowing you as you have been not knowing me. 
right? You have not got it till this very day. But I am in some real way implicated with you. And that's that difficult acknowledgement that one has when one is, is prepared to listen and to see and to know. To know that I can't just judge you. I have to judge myself because I was the one who who handled you. I was the one who, who, who with whom, from whom you, with whom I was in a relationship. And there was something about this relationship and I have to understand that you didn't understand what I'm beginning to understand today. And I didn't understand because, and only today I understand what you are capable of in the fullest sense then, that you are capable of more than I had given you credit for. Now, these are very subtle motions, and they're there in Rashi, they're there in the Midrash, and they're all balanced on a text, a heart to know, eyes to see, ears to hear, that could mean many layers of things. It could be, but somewhere what we're concerned with, basically, is the possibility of not knowing in a situation where one might have known. And Moses' ultimate desire to have them open themselves up, their curiosity, their imagination, to go beyond the blatantly obvious and to understand something about the nuances of things and be willing to risk themselves by going beyond the comfortable area of not knowing into that reaching out for knowledge, reaching out for knowledge of, knowledge, not just intellectual knowledge, but knowledge of the body, knowledge of emotion, knowledge that has to do with Torah Shabbat. And I'll finish with this. Ultimately, what will count is a combination of the written Torah and the oral Torah. A people who depend only on the written text may very well never hear anything that opens them up. They may read the text in a, in a wooden way, only hearing the most obvious layer of the text. And what Moses desperately wants before he leaves is to open a possibility for the people of using their mouths and their ears and their eyes to know more than what is obvious. That will be called the oral law. That will be their access then to the possibility of knowing what the Midrash would say about this, yeah. understanding the hidden layers uh, of, of the story, or at the very least, being aware that I don't know, being aware that I haven't really. And that perhaps is part of the, stru part of the structure of coming to know things. And perhaps I'll finish with this. The structure of psychoanalysis, says Shoshana Feldman, Again, one, one of the, I think, the most interesting women uh, psychoanalytic writers. Um, she says that part of the structure of knowledge is a process in which the recognition of ignorance is essential. It's a, it's a moment in which one understands how in, implicated one is in the obtuseness of other people. <laughs> That is that one also plays a role in the world and there are things that one has refused oneself to know. Right? Now, that you can't get to knowledge without inhabiting that place of ignorance, without really living it. It's not just a question of theoretically knowing as perhaps Socrates meant it, you know, that the height of wisdom is to know that you don't know. Yeah, he meant it more in philosophical terms. But Freud means it in a different, in a different way. Freud and Shoshana Feldman mean it really to sense how wrong I've been in thinking I master things, that I don't master things. And even the teacher doesn't master things. The Rav, right? Rav is a word for master as well as for teacher, right? That persona of Moses, he tries to get beyond in these last speeches. That has been his persona which has been not extremely successful with his contemporaries, with his people. He's really worried for them. He's worried for the future. And so the last moment, his movement is to have them open up a sense of themselves, of their own being, and of the lo mevinim in themselves, the fact that they are non-understanders. They are people whose intuition is limited. And from that point, from that moment, then to be able to try to reach out beyond beyond themselves. 
uh, the last um, quotation I just want to finish with is, it's a kind of shocking moment again, it doesn't, doesn't let up. At the very end of the story, as Moses dies on the top of Mount Nouveau, um, God shows him the land, north, south, east, and west, and Moses looks at it, and then God says to him, and these are the last words Moses hears from God, I have made you see the land, north, south, east, and west. Vishama lo ta'avor. But there you shall not cross over. Now these are, this is the, these are God's last words to Moses. So when I really heard those words, that is, having put together a number of other things, having used whatever faculties I have, you know, to put together a reality that could easily be missed, then again, it's unbelievable in Kafka's sense that God should finish with those words by emphasizing, you know, you will not cross over. Surely it has no practical meaning at all. He's not, it's not information. Moses knows very well that he's not going over there. He's actually seen the land. Why does God have to say to him in so many words, I've shown you the land, but you will not cross over. And again, I think it's a matter of listening to the text. Shama lota avor. There, you will not grasp the object of your desire. You will not reach out and, re and grasp. But in other and more important dimensions, you have found a way of la avor to come across. And these are much more difficult to talk about. How far, how much, how closely did Moses touch the people before he died? We don't know. All we know is that he left behind him that forgetting of the written law, that forgetting of what Moses had actually spoken to them, which gives birth to the oral law. If you are forgotten and you know you're forgotten, if you're ignorant and you, you realize that you have a passion for ignorance, then perhaps you cultivate the other passion. Then you're in a position, perhaps, to cultivate the opposite, an equal passion, which is the passion to reach out, the passion to overcome one's resistance and to reach out towards more, towards other, towards things that perhaps are not so homely, that have what, 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 what Freud calls something uncanny about them. Um, perhaps I should add one more sentence to that. Um, I don't want to end on the note of uncanniness. Uncanny simply means not known. What is familiar, Freud said, but not known. And it's as if that whole area of something that is very close to your heart, right? it's in your mouth and in your heart. If you only find, start talking, you'll, you'll discover what you have in your heart and it will become part of your real life. That's the process that Moses is trying to in gender in the people, starting from a recognition of a personal failure between himself and the people, and then opening up a door for them. And it'll be a door that will begin to open up after he is gone. It's as if in some way he is prepared, he has done the preparation, he's done the work, and the true object of his desire now can begin to feel itself, can begin to spread its wings. And that is the post-Moses life uh, of the people, which is the reason I'd like to say that we call him Moses, our teacher. That is, we call him Moses, our teacher, not only because he gave us much essential information, not only because of the unique moment in which he lived, but perhaps equally, perhaps even more, because of what he left with the people to work with for afterwards and the way in which the whole life of the people has become bound up with that faculty, that faculty of imagination and interpretation and, and making meaning of texts and of life, uh, which we call the oral, the oral traditions. I'm going to stop here. Um, if you have questions, I'm going to let my, my hosts take over at this point. Thank you so much, Aviva. We're going to just take a moment to let the teaching sink in 
and then uh, we'll turn it over to Sue to facilitate the question segment. Thank you so much, Aviva, as always. Now let's prepare for our Q&A. We have turned the chat function back on. Steve, uh, thank you, our Zoom goodbye. You can put your questions there and I'll be collating and moderating from there. And in addition, you can go to the reactions button at the bottom of your screen, kind of in the middle towards the right and click on reactions and you will see a button that also allows you to raise your hand. And uh, we'll be able to see that and take some questions that way too. And when we call on you from a raised hand, we will uh, unmute you or you can unmute yourself. And a request from me and from our congregational leaders, uh, please try to ask your question in one breath and to include a question. Thank you so much. And uh, first I'd like to call on our congregational leaders Julie Batts and Joe Singer to kick us off in the Q&A. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Aviva. Wow, what a mi foi of uh, teaching. So many layers. Um, I'm struck by the, as a parent, by the way that you have um, opened this up. And I'm wondering if you think you know, God knew what was going to happen. It, like a parent sometimes knows the kids throwing a tantrum. I want that thing in a toy store. And the parent has to say, no, 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 because they know they've already bought it for the kid for their birthday. Mm -hmm. You know, and is there a way in which God here is having to say, no, no, no. Knowing that knowing that there there is going to be a reward, which is, I mean, Moses is going to have a legacy. Mo Moses is going to be talked about right here, right now, 4,000 years later. Is there a way that maybe God knows that? I'm wondering if you're seeing that in the text. Uh, I'm, I understand, I'm, I'm moved by your example. Is, is the sound all right? Yes. Sounds rather strange. Okay. Um, I think it's even stronger than that. I think uh, it's not only that God knows that Moses will have a reward, but it's that God is actually moving Moses into a place where he will be able to make it happen. In other words, I think there is, if there is love, you know, if there is love and fear, you know, there are dual emotions between God and human beings, or between parents and children, fear is a bit strong, but uh, then it, the tough love, the tough love sometimes is by way of activating the child. It's making the child realize that I can, we had this just over Shabbat, this child kept on repeating over and over and over again what he wanted, you know, like three words over and over again. I don't know if he thought it would drive us mad or, <laughs> or what was going on there. But you know, um, what had to happen is that somehow he had to be distracted from that. And he had to begin to realize what might be a more fruitful thing to say, to do. And for Moses, it means what, what Freud would call sublimating, sublimating his desire into another form of the same desire, which is, that the people in the land should be able to achieve something which would in a way bring him into their lives forever afterwards. Now, 
that would that more complex gift is not a pure gift from God in in terms of the story. It's the gift is enabling the child to make it come about, enabling Moses to talk to the people in such a way as to in some way transform them uh, right there at the end of the, at the end of the story. Um, so I, th I think it, it, it very much has to do with what you're saying, but but perhaps in, in a more in a, in a in a sense that involves Moses in an active way. I think with children, it's also a good thing to do that. Actually, not not just you know I already bought it for your birthday, but there are things you can do actually to make it happen. Some form of that. And Julie and Jos, uh, do you have any other uh, any other questions before we move on? Okay, great. Um, Something has come up in the chat, um, and then we'll go to Shoshana after that. Um, is the question, is Moses trying to be immortal by wanting to cross over? Hmm. In other words, he doesn't want to die. Is that what you're saying? Is that another way of saying the same thing? Correct. Um, he doesn't want to die. It's very clear. There are midrashim in which he begs to go over even in the form of a bird or of an animal, even if without his present role at all. So there's something very moving about this, you know, the sheer desire for life. And very Jewish, I think, also. You know, you, it's borderline, it's borderline embarrassing again. It's almost too human. But yes, yes, there is that more life, more life. But at the same time, there, there, I, I, I don't think it's immortal. It's not exactly immortal. It's, it's just not to die. And, and then understanding that there's something that can be done from his mortal position and only from his mortal position. That he will not get the, the ear of the people in any other way. Thank you. Uh, Shoshana, I've asked you to unmute. Yeah, um, I, um, I heard you speak in Edmonton over 20 years ago. I apologize, I don't have a question, but I have to say this from my heart. I asked then if I could study at your feet. Unfortunately, it never happened. But I want to thank you, and you are a blessing to us in Galut who are trying to learn. I've watched your YouTube over and over and over and just thank you. Thank you for your teachings and your learnings. And for me in Port Moody, Canada, there isn't a lot of learning. So you on your YouTube and you presence here is just a blessing, is just a blessing. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Francis Landy, yes? Francis, do you remember? No, I, no Francis was in, Ed, yes, in Edmonton. You spoke at oh. Beth Israel Synagogue. And you spoke about uh, Abraham and how he had to be a uh, abused child for what he did going on to Isaac. I remember that. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you, Shoshana. Um, there's a question coming from Rabbi Margaret Holub um, around a wondering whether that Kafkaesque sense of never reaching the beloved is built into Judaism itself in particular? My immediate uh, instinct is yes, but in a very different sense from the Greek, from the Greek sense of eros, the bittersweet. It's not, it's not so much that, that's the Greek sense. I think it's more a sense that the, the best we can do as human beings, and it's a very good best, it turns out, is to speak about it rather than grasp it. That language is not a fallback situation, right? You can't have the rose, so you talk about the rose. You write a poem about the rose. Um, it's actually, it opens things up. That language doesn't close things down, which you could argue that language narrows things. There's a truth to that. But in a certain very interesting way, language also opens things up that would otherwise have been closed. And the actual experience, the historical experience, is not the main thing. 
Okay? As Jews, we insist on certain things in our, the Exodus from Egypt, Mount Sinai, we insist that these were real historical events. And then there are those who come and, and, and have more cynical things to say and more. It's, the truth is, that's not the main thing. The main thing is what we say about it. The stories that are told about it, the way that the laws are investigated and memorialized. We need them both, right? We need the written law, we need something to hold on to. To, to regard as sacred, but it's most the sacredness is mostly in the words and you know, how we communicate to one another and how we give life to, to what's written. Um, and, and so in that sense, yes, I think that desire thing really does, you know, why would why would the love of old age sometimes be not less than the desire of youth? From the point of view of youth, there's no competition. <laughs> who would give up that if you could have that? And yet, sometimes it happens that you know that there is another side to the story that is not all lukewarm water uh, that, that you're left with when the ice cube melts. You know, that there's, mm. There are interesting things. There are interesting things that can, unexpectedly that can happen in the gap between desiring and grasping one's desire. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Franny, if Hi. you'll ask. Yes, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful talk. And it really changed my perspective on Moses. And we think of Moses the prophet. And tell me if this is a crazy way to, what came out of it for me today was that this was Moses' awakening because he was so busy with the people, with the people, he never stopped to look at himself in a way. And I found like that I was just thinking about that now he could say his own words. And what came to me was the Lord hath given him a heart that he like spoke from his heart finally. And that that whole desire that he was human and had to empty himself to cross over to the other side in a whole other way than going to the land of Israel. So thank you so much. I never thought of it this way. Um, I really appreciate it. That himself, as a teacher, is the sound okay? Can you hear me? Yes. There's a kind of terrible silence suddenly when I start talking. Um, that that, that um, uh, the, the, the point was that what, what the Midrash says about not having a heart to, to know and so forth is it sometimes takes 40 years for a student to understand really what his teacher was talking about. Uh, that sounds like a purely educational issue, you know, that sometimes the student needs to keep studying with a teacher for 40 years in order to really get it because there's so many layers. But at the same time, I, I wanted to suggest, I don't probably didn't get far enough with it, that, uh, that for Moses too, 40 years has made a difference. But the 40 years have made the difference for him too, that he now understands something about the capacity of people um, for religious and ethical development more than he had been willing to give them credit for in the past. So that already also says something about the development, the education of Moses at the end uh, in, a, in a more subtle way. Yes. A question that's coming over the chat. Um, can you say more about Moses' dialogue with the people as a kind of reverse analysis? Um, I think that's this is the final crossing over for Moses. It, it, oh, it, throughout his life with the people, he has been in a certain role, which seemed to be the required role, the intermediary, the one who transfers, right? The transfer, yeah, the communicator between God and the people. And that is one of the ways in which we think about teachers about teachers, about translators, yes? That you're taking difficult ideas and you're trying to make them accessible for the people you're talking to, for the, for the students. But it seems there's another role of teaching, 
that remains for him, which has to do with psychoanalysis. It has to do with a, a, a really radical sense of his implication. I keep on using that word because I like it. Implication means being involved from top to bottom in the development of the people. That if they haven't got it, it's because there's something I haven't managed in some way to be the right person who could, who could open them up. And so there's a kind of movement of Moses also to reach out there at the end beyond himself and to find a way of acknowledging a certain kind of, what can I say, a certain kind of closeness in himself and overcome it. So I think a psychoanalysis does come into play here, although it is a little far-fetched from the point of view of, of traditional rabbinic thinking. Uh, in the end, I don't think it's really out of, out of sync. Thank you. I saw Yael Peskin with a raised hand and wanted to know if you wanted to jump in here. You're on mute still. I think Yael did not want to jump in, so. Okay, all right. Another qu a question from the chat that came in earlier. Um, what if Moses had actually crossed over and had entered the land? Um, will his desire or would his desire be satisfied or would that also prove to be bittersweet? Mm -hmm. That actually gets some attention by, from the rabbis in the Midrash. I mean, what they say is that that wouldn't have been a world for him. That he doesn't realize how much the world is going to change after him, but the, uh, the life in the land will be extremely different from life in the wilderness. And in a way, all his ways of being would be outmoded. He wouldn't find his, as we say in Hebrew, he wouldn't find his hands and his feet. But in some way, he is made for the experience, the wilderness sojourn, the wilderness time, Egypt and the wilderness time, in ways that have to do with his way of being. The, the, the authority, the mountain and the wilderness, not cultivating the land, not agriculture, not the life of nature, right? a kind of direct access to God. But the life of nature is a different life. And for that, you need a different leader. So the, the guess based on rabbinic thinking would be that if somehow he had got in there, he would have felt himself very much out of place. You know, there are, there are these myths I think it rings a bell from other cultures where you, you find yourself, Rip Van Winkle, or you find yourself in a, in a world, you get your heart's desire not to die, but then you find yourself in a world where you, you don't get it, basically. So I think that something like that is, that's what I imagine. And it wouldn't have happened. It simply wouldn't have happened. Thank you. Um could it be that um, the people were, were done with Moses um, and uh, afraid that uh, by crossing over, by Moses crossing over, that he would continue to try to lead and not hang, hand things over? Could be. It's also possible, um, which increases the, the poignancy of the situation. You know, again, if you met human terms, you know, the elderly parent in the relation to, to the children, it's, it's not simple. Can you say um, again and some more about um, this idea about the a passion for ignorance, which is a paradox? I think it has to do with this unwillingness to acknowledge the real meaning of what one is experiencing. And that the real meaning, again, implicates oneself. And the, the liking we have for, for, for criticizing others, <laughs> if I can put it very crudely, or for judging others, for evaluating others and where they fall short and without 
realizing that any any system of thinking one is using involves oneself as well. And somewhere, what about me? That question, what about me? What does it say about me? Um, uh, not in the sense of it's not about you, it's about you. Know, it means that in some, on some level, it's always about you. If you are involved in a, in a situation, then you carry some responsibility. And so there's a desire to resist. And I, it's called resistance in psychoanalysis. I don't want to, I don't want to acknowledge a difficult, uncomfortable uh, truth about myself, uh, particularly in relation to others. I suppose it, that's where it really becomes becomes a, a question. Um, I think that's that's, that's what I that, that's that's all I can say about it for the moment. Thank you. Sher uh, Sherry Manning asks in the chat, uh, I'm reminded of the Robert Browning quote, a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's heaven for? And the question, uh, the question is, do you think that in some way that Moshe misunderstands his mission, uh, which is you shall take my people out of Egypt? His, his mission, which is? Uh, Exodus 3.10, you shall take people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So in what way does he misunderstand it? Um, uh, that it, it's not, you know, he's, he's asked to take them out of Egypt, not to get them in uh, to Canaan. Except that um, God doesn't clearly say, I think the, the implication at the beginning is that he is going to lead them all the way into the land. It's not quite as simple as that you know there's i will i will take you out of here and i'll bring you into there that's that's the, the four expressions of redemption uh, that we have right at the beginning there include a fifth one which is i will bring you into into the land so mm -hmm. you know, there, life is unfair there, there 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 is an unfairness about it because you could have imagined certainly in youth you are you imagine that you why not live forever why not be able to complete the story and it's only gradually and in, 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 a, in a, sense of a sense of failure and frustration that, that you realize that it's just not, not the way things are. Um, it sounded like Yael was coming back in with a question. Yeah. Yes, I see you, yes. Yeah, Al, you can unmute now. Unmute. I, I, have I got it here? Yes, we hear you. No, my, my question was just, um, you know, when God says to Moses, you can see the land, maybe, it, maybe he didn't have to actually go into it. That this whole journey where he's, you were talking about he's go, go, going, and that's his orientation, and that now he's, he's got it all. He doesn't actually need to get into the land itself. He can see it. He has it within him. I think that's very beautiful. Yes. I, mean, I If one doesn't take it in a facile way, uh, I think delicately, if one takes it delicately, then, then I, I think it's absolutely right. And when God says, you shall see, Moses perhaps can't hear that at first, because seeing for him meant being there. But by the time at the end, God says to him, you see, I've shown you. I've shown you. And, and then there is the implication, which you do find in rabbinic sources, that seeing at this point is visionary seeing. It's not, it's not that you can see the the carpet, <laughs> you know, the, the patches of land there. It's it's something else. It's it's a kind of visionary sense, perhaps, of the future, of the past, the meaning of things. So it's again the idea of having eyes and not seeing, as applied to himself. That in the end, there is a moment of vision. Thank you. Uh, one last question before we wrap. Um, is Moses not really aware of the totality of his role until the very end? 
what do you mean by totality? Um, that there's there is there's a multiplicity of what uh, Moses is doing for the people, uh, and that he's not really aware. Do you think his awareness is not um, complete until he's really right at the end uh, of of his, of his life in those last moments? That's I hadn't thought of that, but I think that's that's very strong. Yes. Otherwise, there'll be no point in God saying to him, what has already happened? <laughs> you know, I have shown you the land. Why say the words? You know, it's not that you've seen the land. It's that God tells you you've seen the land. You know, and at that moment, perhaps something happens. You know, it's a connection with God. Um, so I, I, I actually like that very much. I may appropriate it <laughs> in the name of well, one. It came in from our friends, uh, Ross and Hannah um, in the chat and uh, really, really appreciate that. I'm I, so appreciative of this teaching and thank you very much to everyone for your engagement. And I'm going to turn it back over to the good folks at Hokmat to wrap us up. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you so much, Aviva. It's incredible to learn with you. We feel so lucky, so blessed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we are also grateful to all of our co-sponsors. We'll have a slide up in a moment. We thank them at the beginning and you'll see them again here. And thank you to Steve uh, for all of your tech support. And we're gonna turn it over just for a moment uh, to Dorit, our executive director, and then we will sign off and wish you all a wonderful rest of your day, filled up and inspired by this wonderful teaching. Dorit? Hi, everyone. I'm the executive director at Chachmat Halev. Thank you so much, Aviva, for sharing some of your knowledge and time with us. It's so meaningful for us. Uh, if you want to sign up, stay in touch with us, you can sign up for our mailing list or friend us on Facebook. The links are in the chat. Uh, you can donate to support us in hosting more programs like this. A link for that's also in the chat. And if you want to know more about Dr. Zornberg, uh, she has a website which we'll post. And also the, this lecture is based on a book she wrote of the same name. You could read the book online at Safaria or purchase it from Powell's Books or your local bookseller. Thank you very much.